Okay, th thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Eilish, and thank you to the uh, TMRN for the invitation to come and speak. It's great to see uh, so many people. Um, we are ourselves on a sort of journey about learning uh, more about realist methods and we're exploring different ways of, of applying those and I'm sure there's people in this room who've also been on that sort of uh, learning uh, journey so we're hoping it's going to be a conversation as well as us trying to convey to you some of the things that, that we've learnt and why we've uh, engaged in this sort of work. Um, I was noting when Eilish was saying that it's a developing area and it's a sort of new experience for me to be in an area that's actually becoming more popular Usually I go into areas that are becoming less popular, so, um, so that, that's fun. So um, we want to, uh, as Eilish was, was saying, to um, look at uh, why you'd want to adopt a realist perspective. Um, we appreciate that many people here are interested in looking at uh, clinical trials or systematic reviews uh, and, and so on. Uh, and one question is, can a realist perspective add something to that? Well, we think it, it can. Uh, and we want to look at the, the realist review method, which is a sort of systematic review method. Um, but we also want to look at uh, evaluation uh, of interventions. And then if we have time to talk something around the uh, synthesis of this. So we, we have about two hours and we'd, we'd like it to be very conversational, so please uh, do chip in and do uh, interrupt us and, and so on. Okay, so um, artifacts and the art of understanding uh, facts. Um, I was trying to think of a good way of relating this. Now you may think this is not a good way of relating it, <laughs> but I was, are there any archaeologists in the room? No, okay, that's good. That's a good, <laughs> that's a good start. But. Um, I was sort of thinking that certainly a lot of the research that I've done has been very research results focused. So the research has been about getting the result. Um, and it occurred to me that really it's a bit like um, somebody digging away in Pompeii there, finding an artifact and saying this is what I've been after, um, and then sort of hypothesizing about it. You know, I wonder what they used this bit of a pot for. I wonder what sort of social context this was in, how was it made, what was the intention behind it. Um, and so very often the research that I've been involved in is I've got the bit of the pot, that's the, that's the result. Um, and what these archaeologists would love, of course, would be able to stand up and be back in time and have all the people walking around them and to understand what the function of this uh, entity is. Uh, socially and physically and so on. And in a sense that's what a realist review is trying to do. It's saying yeah we've got this outcome, this result, but you know what we need to understand what it means in terms of the, the function of it to the people who've been uh, involved in it. So you know I think the, um, the, the, there was a study done a number of years ago looking at intervention uh, trials uh, in, in Scotland um, and they looked across a number of different uh, schools and what they found was that in some schools the uh, intervention worked and in other schools the intervention didn't work um, and from our point of view that's the interesting result um, so you could average out the, uh, the result or you could say What's really interesting is why it has traction in one context and why it doesn't have traction uh, in another context. So the, the realist question is not so much, does it work? Uh, it's much more, uh, as it says here, it's about for whom, uh, under what circumstances, in what respects, because not necessarily all aspects of the intervention work for everybody in the same way. Over what duration? Is it short term? Is it time limited? Uh, does it actually not kick in until three months after the uh, intervention? Uh, and above all, wh wh why? Uh, what's, what's the sort of mechanism for making it work? So one of the terms we'll use here is uh, a program. And really a program 
is the overall approach to doing things and it's understanding from a theoretical basis why something might or might not work. So to give you a very simple example, um, some of the work uh, I've uh, been involved in has been around cognitive behaviour therapy um, and what you do in cognitive behaviour therapy is you give people a manual and they learn how to do that un under supervision. Um, so you could say the manual is the intervention or you could say well the supervision and the manual is the intervention or you could say it's the supervision and the manual and the sort of people you're treating and the sort of place they're in and the level of unemployment and the opportunities to get positive experiences outside and so on. So this notion of a program is much, much broader and the idea is that you have a theory where your intervention, if you like, is a component but it's, it's not the only thing and it may not even be the most important thing. And I think many of us have probably been involved in interventions whereby it works in one place, doesn't work in another. A lot of our work in the Centre for Global Health is multi-country and multi-context within those countries. Um, and you get extremely inconsistent results. And you can conclude one thing like, oh, it's inconsistent, it doesn't work. Or you can say, it's really interesting that it's working, sometimes a bit annoying, <laughs> but it's really interesting that it's working like this in one place and it's not working like that in another place. So that's where we're coming from. I suppose it's a sort of pragmatic concern to develop theory that's going to be contextually uh, relevant. So we have a, a sort of pipeline uh, approach. I guess we're familiar with the idea that we have our research questions, we put the research into the pipeline and then the practitioners and policy makers aim to take that research out. When they take it out, of course, it goes into organizations and systems and social structures and, and so on. So any result going through here needs this sort of unfreezing and realignment and refreezing uh, and so on. And so a realist approach is trying to certainly take this into account, but it's saying this sort of stuff is just as important. Now, um, I wanted to make some <coughs> critical remarks about systematic reviews and I was very sensitive about this so I thought I would rather than slagging off other people's research I'd slag off my own research I thought that would be relatively safe um, so w w I've been involved in a, in a number of, of reviews um, just to give you a few examples so for instance this this paper um, I'm part of a group called Evidence Aid and we look at providing uh, evidence that's effective in uh, emergency response situations. It's quite easy to identify what are the good things to do. It's quite difficult to identify how would you actually do them in situations that, that vary from earthquakes um, to uh, tsunamis to, to conflict because what you have available to work with is very different in these sorts of situations. Um, Let's see, an, another one that um, myself and uh, Eilish were, were involved in. This is with the, the EPI Centre. Uh, we did this study which involved initially identifying 23,000 non-original uh, uh, records. And then we went through the usual process of uh, trying to identify our RCTs and whittling it down. We ended up with one and it was of very poor quality. So that was funded by DFID, the, the British Aid Agency. Um, it cost a lot of money, uh, it took a lot of time, and we ended up, as I have in some of these other things, saying, don't really know, and more, more research uh, is, is needed. Uh, similarly, the first uh, sort of um, highly systematic review I was involved in, I guess, was the, the Cochrane one. I was a, a Cochrane uh, fellow. Um, did the sort of Cochrane training around this one. Um, again, a very heavily involved in terms of labour. Um, we ended up with six papers that's, that were sort of okay and we ended up having to say we, we don't know, the evidence isn't strong enough, we think it might be this, but more, more research is needed. Um, in all of these reviews, there's actually lots of useful information, but it doesn't necessarily conform to the 
RCT uh, standard. Um, certainly where there is good RCT stuff, great. Um, but of course, just because something is an RCT doesn't mean that it's necessarily a, a good study. There can be all sorts of variations in terms of blinding and sampling and, and so on. So, one of the things we're trying to do is to change the, the basic metaphor. So, having done a systematic review, I guess one often looks for the uh, sort of a meta statistic in terms of does it work? And we get something that we would argue you need to be a bit more sophisticated. Normally, we'd look at the, the one outcome, and then we'd look at another outcome, a further outcome, another one, get excited, yes, mean effect, whoa. All right, so we say, yes, it works. Now, I think, and I hope you think, that what's really interesting is why the same thing produces such different effects. Um, and if you want to look at using that intervention in another context, then you're actually, it's reassuring to know it works in an overall way, but it's much more useful to know what are the factors that are making it and what are the factors that are uh, inhibiting it uh, from working. So from a realist uh, perspective, the idea that whether it's a manual um, or indeed a drug um, or indeed a, a broader social intervention, they don't work uh, by themselves. And the, 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 the idea of the process, many of these things, certainly in the more psychosocial context, they are being done onto beings that reflect back what is being done on them. So they're not sort of passive recipients, obviously. Um, so as you lay the road, you know, the road changes direction um, all of the time. So this idea that people interpret and act upon uh, an intervention, um, and indeed there may be multiple, uh, uh, multiple mechanisms at work, and that there can be a whole range of different sorts of contexts that, that are influential. So just to give you, you know, it could be uh, time, place, individuals, teams, institutions, uh, and, and so on. Certainly in things that are more psychosocially related um, or economically, um, it would be really bizarre if we had an intervention with people that wasn't influenced by things like, like this. You'd think you'd have a pretty insensitive intervention if it wasn't responding to those sorts of factors. So, um, you have a, a particular situation, um, a particular intervention, um, and then a particular outcome, a slightly different situation. I stole this slide from someone. A, uh, uh, the same intervention, um, but a different type of outcome. So you can be doing, from a, a practitioner point of view, you can be doing the right thing, but it's having the wrong effect. And of course sometimes you can be doing exactly the same thing and it has exactly opposite effects. I've certainly have had that situation. So not doing anything wrong but sometimes doing harm whereas in other situations it's been uh, beneficial. So we've been involved in a couple of uh, reviews. These were the, the, the reviews that we did with WHO. Um, we now have a couple of papers that um, Bryn is the lead author on one of them and Joanne is the lead author on the other one. These have been uh, submitted for uh, publication. We have other reviews uh, in process uh, at the moment. Uh, it is a, a new area um, and so one's always a bit nervous in terms of submitting things. There are some very good reviews published uh, out there, realist reviews in, in good journals and, and so on. But often people come across these reviews and think, whoa, what's, what's going on here? Because normally, the analogy I like to use is you read a paper sort of like that, up and down. Uh, whereas in a realist review, you sort of read it across. All the things that I was sort of implicitly taught to skip over, <laughs> look at the abstract, get a, you know, read the, the first line in each paragraph, skip to the end, and then if you weren't sure, you know, check something in the middle, uh, in fact, you go to the middle 
first almost, and you say, okay, so what's the method? What did they, who was involved? How did they do that? Oh, it doesn't tell you. <laughs> so most of the stuff you really want to know when you start reading it from a realist perspective isn't often there. Um, and you start to think, whoa, how can they actually attribute these causes without actually explaining how they, how they got to this point? So it's really sort of fundamental, uh, fundamental stuff. I like to visualize it um, as that we are certainly concerned with the, the content um, and the, the content as far as I'm concerned is still the, the primary thing but the content itself has to be bedded within the process by which you go about trying to achieve that and the content can be any sort of intervention um, and the context in which it occurs uh, th these are all as it says they are sort of cupped in each other um, and it, it's only going to work maximally if you can address each of these uh, in unison. So um, I'm going to hand over to Joanne. Um, my name is Joanne McFay and I'm a doctoral researcher in the Centre for Global Health and School of Psychology. Um, as Mac has suggested, I'm going to be talking about realist reviews and Brain will uh, progress by talking about a realist evaluation, which is a slightly different sort of thing. So I'll discuss the components of a realist review and also the differences between a realist review and a traditional Cochrane review in more detail. <laughs> Here? Oh, sorry. Okay. So while realist reviews do adopt some techniques from traditional Cochrane-style reviews, nonetheless Cochrane-style reviews are perhaps more important for what are termed as simple interventions. So realist reviews provide a tool for heterogeneous design, setting, context, people, interventions and outcome measures. For this reason, realist reviews are proposed as being more appropriate for complex interventions. And complex interventions have components that usually don't act in a linear fashion. They're interventions for which people are at the heart of and are therefore kind of unpredictable. And they're also highly dependent on the context of the intervention. So the aim of a realist review, as you know, is to answer how, why, for whom, under what circumstances um, an intervention works or does not work. So realist reviews can be described as interpretive, reflexive and an iterative process rather than a linear process which is really inherited, uh, inherent in a Cochrane style review which examine con contextual conditions that make an, an intervention effective or not effective. The focus of a realist review is usually more to explain rather to judge whether an intervention is useful or beneficial or whether it works or does not work. And at the core of realist reviews are CMOCs context mechanisms outcome configurations that allow understand, one to understand what works for whom and under what circumstances. So Wong and colleagues have outlined a very useful uh, description of the differences between a Cochrane review and a realist review. While a Cochrane review will identify the review question, a realist review will clarify the scope of the review more broadly. And while this entails also identifying the review question, it also involves refining the purpose of the review, articulating the key candid theories to be explored. While a Cochrane review searches for primary studies mainly, using clearly, defined pre, uh, clearly predefined inclusion and exclusion criteria, a realist review searches for relevant evidence, so the range of evidence that can be used for a realist review is much wider than primary studies um, that are used for Cochrane reviews. And the inclusion criteria are consistently revised as the realist, realist review goes on. A Cochrane review appraises the quality of the study using a predefined and validated quality measurement tool. A realist review appraises the quality using judgment um, from a fitness for purpose perspective. While a Cochrane review extracts standards items of data from all primary studies using ma matrix, a realist review extracts different data from different sources using different tools. So Enviva can be used or Excel, um, depending on the study under investigation. A Cochrane review synthesizes the data to obtain ex effect size and a confidence interval and transferable themes if a qualitative study is being used. A realist review synthesizes the data to achieve a program theory, refinement of the program theory, which can be the intervention itself, and um, that is to determine what works for whom, how and under what circumstances. 
A uh, Cochrane Review makes recommendations, especially with reference to whether findings are definitive or whether future research is needed. A Realist Review does also make recommendations, um, but with reference to the contextual issues for policymakers uh, at particular points in time. A Cochrane Review finally will disseminate findings and evaluate the extent to which partic practitioners' behaviour changes in a particular direction. A Realist Review conversely disseminates the findings and evaluates the extent to which existing programmes are adjusted as a result of the programme theory that was refined um, or revealed by the review. Um, so a context specifically asks what conditions are required for measure to, to trigger mechanisms for this particular outcome. Well this is Tilly's definition at least. A mechanism asks what is it about a measure that will lead it to have a particular outcome. And the outcomes describe the practical effects given in a particular context. Collectively, these are known as CMOCs. Um, okay, to provide two examples of realist reviews that were conducted in the Centre for Global Health, which Mac spoke about earlier, these are commissioned by the WHO to inform the upcoming guidelines on health-related rehabilitation. The first related to policy-related governance of rehabilitation, and the second related to rehabilitation workforce. Um, so we use a Cochrane style systematic search strategy which is quite unusual for a realist review and it's not really necessary but we just thought that this would help the research process to be more robust really. Um, so in our search strategy we outlined strict inclusion and exclusion criteria and databases and the types of documents that were included. So these included original research articles, descriptions of interventions and contexts, literature reviews and recommendations from symposia such as the WHO intercountry meeting reports. So it was a much wider range than from a traditional Cochrane style review. Um, and the articles were each assessed by two reviewers and when re reviewers disagree this is passed on to a third reviewer. We used a CMOC's extraction template. Each reviewer, each of the two reviewers for each article used this template to outline the context, mechanisms and outcomes and the final CMOC's from, from this analysis. And we related those CMOC's to our original research questions posed by the WHO, but obviously these can be any research questions relevant to your research. We then use the CMOC's synthesizing template to synthesize the CMOC's from each reviewer's analysis of each article. Um, so as you can see on the top row these are the, the characteristics of the document and on the bottom row we outline the context mechanisms outcomes and the final CMOC's for every article. So this is a synthesis of both reviewers um, extraction of CMOC's. Does anybody have any questions so far? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm going to do that now, yeah. Two steps ahead. <laughs> um, so, for example, um, in one study from the Governance uh, Realist Review, this was conducted by Araya and colleagues, and it described a national depression and detection treatment program in Chile in the primary care setting. And it was described as an example of a mental health program that was scaled up to the national level in a lower middle income country. So it was quite an unusual intervention that uh, was deemed very successful. The aim of the study itself was to conduct a qualitative un uh, assessment to better understand why or how the policymakers decided to, to scale up the intervention in the first place to the national level. So here you can see the completed CMOC synthesis statement and um, the setting was Chile. The design was a qualitative study including in-depth semi-structured interviews with six key informants. The population was senior officers at the Ministry of Health who were directly involved in deciding to scale up the program. The intervention itself was the depression detection and treatment program. Um, and this operated within a primary care network comprising over 500 primary care settings throughout the country. Each of these settings had a general clinical team comprising doctors, nurses and auxiliary nurses. For the governance realist review we also outlined whether each article was a system wide or project specific intervention. For this article it was project specific because it referred only to the depression detection and treatment program. 
We also outlined for the governance health package whether the, uh, whether the study was sectoral or intersectoral. For this study, it was intersectoral um, beca because it outlined strategic alliances that were created between the mental health unit and the primary care division, with the Ministry of Women and across sectors with strategic partners. The cadre was obviously the senior officers at the Ministry of Health and the quality was a three quality rating. Now we used a more systematic uh, quality appraisal tool which was a mixed methods appraisal tool by Plu and colleagues and this allowed for a systematic and more robust appraisal of the articles um, as it allows for the appraisal of qualitative, quantitative and mixed method studies. Okay, so as an example of the context that were extracted and synthesised from this article, one context related to scientific evidence, whereby an RCT of a programme to improve the management of depressed women in the primary care setting showed positive results. And this evidence was leveraged um, to the policy makers to advocate for more resources for mental health. Um, regarding teamwork and leadership, an informal team of leaders acted in parallel at different levels and with a shared vision. Strategic alliances were also at play, um, whereby there was strong alliances between the mental health unit and the primary care division. Regarding program institutionalisation, there was strong program institutionalisation, which we felt led to the sustainability of the program, which I'll speak to in a minute. And finally, a context was task shifting, whereby there was a transfer, transfer of responsibilities from psychiatrists to psychologists um, throughout the intervention. Moving on to mechanisms, um, so with regard to scientific evidence, all information was presented proactively, succinctly and in a format that could be easily understood by policymakers, which seemed to be key to why that evidence was actually leveraged uh, usefully or effectively. Um, there was a group of widely respected and politically friendly professionals who collaborated with a common goal, who acted as leaders in a team effort. So it wasn't just one leader, it was distributed leadership that was very effective. There were strategic alliances um, whereby the mental health unit had the technical capacity while the primary care division had all the resources. So there was a good alliance and uh, mutual benefits on both sides. And the program was effectively institutionalized. So the program was aligned with well-known and pre-existing models of healthcare delivery within the Ministry of Health, similar to those of pre-existing programs that had worked in the past, which kind of, I suppose, helped to create trust in the model of care that was being presented. And finally, task shifting increased the availability of human resources from psychiatrists to psychologists. So psychologists were a cadre that were widely uh, available at, uh, at an affordable cost, more so than psych psychiatrists um, in the country at the time. Regarding outcomes in relation to scientific evidence, the Ministry of Health decided that depression would become the third highest health priority for 2002. I ran this presentation by my colleague Fiona earlier and she said, well, what were the other two? What were the highest two? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and teamwork and leadership, an outcome um, that was extracted and synthesised um, related to the effective leadership which facilitated the creation of powerful strategic alliances, which facilitate institutionalising the programme within the ministerial framework. Um, so strate strategic alliances were created as an outcome of the intervention. The primary care division as a result of these alliances accepted ownership and management of the programme. And because of the programme institutionalisation there was high programme sustainability. Um, and finally task shifting because the programme was scaled up, when the programme was scaled up psychologists were hired in all primary care centres as key actors rather than psychiatrists and became the cornerstone of the programme. So as you know, these are all jumbled up and mixed and finally amalgamated into CMOC. It's a very exciting process. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these are the CMOCs. So it's important um, to remember that all CMOCs need, really need a context, a mechanism, an outcome to be CMOCs. Um, so as an example in relation to scientific evidence, in contexts where scientific evidence on a health issue is collected, such evidence when used to effectively advocate for more resources, when it's based on local data and effectively presented to policymakers, can show that a health issue is a public health priority. In um, relation to teamwork and leadership, in contexts where leadership is shared by an informal team of capable leaders who act in parallel with a shared vision, such leadership can create powerful strategic alliances and facilitate the institutionalising of a programme. As further examples, 
in contexts where strong strategic alliances are created across units, sectors and departments and institutions, such alliances can allow for the strengths and resources to be shared, provide additional support for the introduction of a program and create co-ownership and co-management of, of an intervention. When programs are institutionalised through processes including aligning a program with well-known and pre-established models of healthcare within the Ministry of Health, securing a critical mass of funding and human resources, which were psychologists in this case, such institutionalising may result in strong program sustainability. And finally, task shifting. In context of a lack of specialised human resources for health, task shifting to alternative cadres can uh, make available an alternative cadre at an affordable cost so that more patients receive treatment. And this is what the completed CMOC synthesis uh, template looks like for this article. So here you can see, as I outlined previously, the characteristics of the article and the context, mechanisms, outcomes and the final CMOCs. So we found this to be a very useful tool um, and simple tool just to synthesise from both reviewers. At what stage yeah. did the two reviewers come together? So did you go through that whole process individually? Yes. Okay, yeah. So you, you actually determined your CMOC? Yeah, we each, uh, each reviewer independently assessed each article and when there was disagreement it was passed on to a third reviewer and at the end uh, the primary reviewer, which is me or Bryn for the other work package, synthesised both CMOCs from each reviewer. As a second example from the Rehabilitation Workforce uh, Realist Review conducted for the WHO, this was a study by Raman and colleagues which was published in 2008 in The Lancet and it described a lay level cadre in Pakistan that were using cognitive based therapy for pregnant women who were in their late stages of pregnancy and their first year of postnatal period. The setting was Pakistan, the design was a cluster randomised controlled trial the population was 903 married women in their third trimester aged 16 to 45. And the intervention was called the Thinking Healthy Programme. It was a mental health programme. Um, it was delivered by lady health workers um, who implemented the programme with one session per week in the last month of pregnancy, three in the first month postnatal and one session per month for the next nine months. This intervention was compared to a control group or what were called enhanced routine care group. Again we completed the CMOC synthesis template. So the cadre were lady health workers. They had completed secondary school, were recommended by their communities, were already responsible for maternal and child health care in the community which was important and for community education. They were already integrated into the health systems and they were each responsible for approximately 100 households and they had approximately 80% coverage of rural Pakistan. They were trained in maternal and child health care and community education already and had monthly supervision as well as supervision by the research team during the process of the study. They weren't permitted to uh, be involved in any other income earning activities. Contexts that were extracted and synthesised from this study were that there were already established union councils, the Thinking Healthy programme integrated into Lady Health Workers' regular maternal and child health routine. So it wasn't an additional burden on, on the community health workers. There was an established method of referrals through supervisory pathways. The Lady Health Workers were already trained and supervised and were already working as lay, as lay health workers. They were trained specifically on the, train, on the Thinking Healthy program by experts and the team and they were also provided with a manual for reference. And this outlines the outcome, the mechanisms that uh, I suppose carried our context into, into outcomes. There was a possible reduction of stigma since the program was delivered through the regular, regular interventions uh, implemented by, by these lady health workers. The, was an, there was an integration of families into the programme and having them be, be more active uh, members throughout the intervention as well as having homework for the participants. So involving families may have helped the effectiveness of the programme but it also may have had additional uh, unanticipated effects such as the fathers who reported playing with their infants more that, so than before the intervention. Um, the intervention was for women um, with only laid, lady health workers and so this could have meant it was more comfortable and easier for the lady health workers and women to relate and discuss sensitive issues. 
Um, there was health worker integration and standardised training support and country recognition. And it's likely that the lady health workers were well known and already respected in the community. They were trained and working and already integrated into the system, so just as seen as an additional training package for the flat cadre. While there was no difference in child health outcomes, so for this study, child health, health, child health outcomes and maternal health outcomes were assessed, such as stunting. The there was a possibility of having lady ho health workers' focus be taken away from their usual maternal and child health care to deliver this mental health package. Um, so that could have been the reason why those differences between the intervention and control group weren't found. The lady health workers were strongly invested in the community as being members of and chosen by the community and also having this as their full-time job. And because they were treated professionally, this may have been motivating for the lady health workers. Outcomes of this intervention were that there was reduced depression at six months postpartum, which was sustained at the one-year period. There was no difference, however, for child weight for height between the intervention and control group. There was high acceptability. Um, if we look at the percent of mothers who were analysed after six months and 12, and 12 months, so this is the same between the intervention and control group. There was reduced diarrheal disease in infants, increase in immunisation use of contraception, and increase in play-related activities between the mother and infants. And the lady health workers also claimed that their job size and scope didn't increase as a result of this intervention. So CMOCs that were amalgamated from this study were that by having a rehabilitation worker that you can better relate to, this may increase the acceptability of interventions. Family involvement in interventions may be beneficial and increase the acceptability of the intervention and also have unintended beneficial outcomes. Using an already trained and practicing workforce and having an additional component of training may help to reduce stigma and acceptability of an intervention due to the trust that the community already have in that cadre. And rehabilitation workers identified the, by the community are more acceptable and have higher ownership and accountability of an intervention, which may increase retention and motivation. And final theme of C's for this study included that rehabilitation workers that are formally integrated and supported by sy the government systems who have prerequisites before being hired, such as, in this case, a secondary level education, and structured training and supervision, um, this impacts positively on retention and motivation. Government support was found to be effective um, with regards to financial support and by integrating the lady health workers and this intervention into the already existing system. And there was a clear referral system in place with specialised uh, rehabilitation workers if needed. Strong and ongoing support for the health workers from supervisors, research team supervisors, uh, monthly may have helped them to cope with stress. So here again you can see the completed CMOC's synthesis template with the document characteristics above, the context, mechanism and outcomes that I've just described below, and the final CMOC's. Thank you. Brain is going to now talk about some of our work with the World Vision. Um, and in terms of the sort of practicalities of uh, project evaluation. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, just, I guess, a quick presentation overview. It would be very similar to Joanne's, but only I'm going to be doing realist evaluation, which is the primary um, methodology. So, where realist reviews are a secondary study using already um, completed studies, this is conducting a primary study using realist methodology. So. Um, Quickly, just kind of as Mac did, I have done systematic reviews before, so I've come from a systematic review background, and then I kind of, a systematic review and implementation science, so looking at how to best operationalize programs, um, and then got turned on to the WHO, so it was kind of a, oh, realist review, okay, that's the introduction to realism. Um, but actually from there, uh, finding it really, really applicable for the implementation science field. So if you're into like operations research, implementation science, um, this is more what I'll be talking about and how to use uh, realist evaluation within this field. Um, so specifically, I'm working on a team but leading the research evaluation part for a mixed method study in Turkey, Iraq and Lebanon, dealing with um, community health workers for the Syrian crisis. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that, but in terms of Niall's question on kind of like publication and also this growing field, um, this seed funding study was actually funded by Wellcome Trust and DFID. So they gave us money to conduct this preliminary, developing this theory, I guess, of a realist evaluation. 
Um, and then my doctoral thesis is using a uh, two country case study realist evaluation with uh, the implementing partner, the NGO World Vision, in two countries. Um, and that's the case that I'm going to kind of walk you through to kind of show you the beginnings of at least how to do a realist evaluation. Um, but first, just why a realist evaluation? Um, and I think it's important, it's not applicable to everything, obviously. There does have to be a, a program focus. Um, you have to do it on a program, essentially. Uh, specifically, programs that operate in open systems, so these complex health interventions, are really useful for using a realist evaluation to understand how they work and why they're working. Uh, so as Mac and Joe have already um, talked about, that uh, not like a lot of our programs or interventions are complex and they operate within open systems meaning that we can't control for the context we can't control for human experience I can't say that because I'm running this intervention person A and person B are going to react the same way um, whether that be their background whether it be their age their gender their family history there's many different factors that can influence why one person is going to receive an intervention one way and might receive a different way. You might actually end up with the same outcome at the end, but how that person got to that outcome can be completely different. Um, and that's what realist evaluations want to understand. We want to know how that outcome came to be, because that is at least what realist evaluations say. And what I think, and probably a lot of you think since you're here, is that that process is important. Um, and understanding that process, those mechanisms, will better help us to target interventions, to strengthen interventions, and to transfer interventions across different cases. So just kind of a comparison between um, different study types, I guess. Uh, this is from Poston and Tilly, who if you really want to get into realist evaluation or realist review, Poston and Tilly are your they're your people. Um, this is their realistic evaluation book, which was 1997. So they actually started with realist evaluation um, based on critical realism, which I'll talk about in a second. And then they developed the realist review as the secondary study. And that started more around 2002. So this is kind of a lot of the theory and a lot of the, the practical side of it is this realistic evaluation book. Um, so if we look at programs as treatment, so you're kind of more traditional positivist studies we're going to see X our input and Y our outcome and this is what we're looking at um, series of change so Weiss and theory of change we are going to see we're looking at the mechanisms and how things are working and that's great and realist evaluations kind of like that as well but with a realist evaluation we're looking at it across different contexts as well and we want to look so you know these mechanisms of change might be different in the different contexts, and we want to understand those patterns. Um, so, realist evaluations are a form of theory driven evaluations. Uh, Chen and Rossi, if you want to read more into theory driven evaluations, um, and they seek to understand the mechanisms through which social program outcomes um, occur and operate. Uh, so they were address, theory driven evaluations overall were developed to address the problem seen with very typical positivist studies um, that are limited to kind of examining the cause and effect so our experimental design studies um, but those don't take into account the context and the people as autonomous agents within those um, interventions so Pawson and Tilly 1992 pioneered realist evaluation which is based on the epistemology of critical realism. So Basher, um, it's not 100% a linear direct descendant of critical realism, but a lot of the, the epistemology, those approaches are, are, very, are based on critical realism. Um, so it is a primary study for using realist methods. And as we've kind of talked about, it still is relatively young and it is undergoing changes and additions. Um, there's lots of papers out there on what is a realist evaluation, but not as many papers out there on an actual realist evaluation. And a lot of the comments when people are reading or the realist evaluation group is everybody's asking, you know, publish in detail, like publish how you sampled, publish how you analyzed, publish how you did this, because that kind of knowledge on how to actually do it step by step. Um, the, the details are, are still somewhat missing, but they are increasingly being used to inform complex health interventions. And I think if I graphed the <laughs> publications 
coming out, it would definitely be going exponentially. So I think there is some traction and we're definitely on the upside right now. But um, so overall, their objective is to develop policy relevant explanatory program theories using intraprogram comparison. So you don't have to use an intraprogram comparison. You could just do a realist evaluation on one program. That will give you your theory. That will give you a refined theory. If you can do it across the si using the same program across different sites, so what I'm doing with this study, you're going to have more refined program theory. So it's more likely to be transferable. You can just do one case study. You can do 100 case studies. Um, essentially, it is this kind of iterative, never-ending process. And the more you do, <laughs> the more refined and transferable and probably real your theory is, I guess. But, um, so it is this what works for whom and why, as Joan Mack have said. Um, and it really is starting by eliciting our initial program theories and then refining these program theories. So it's this two-step process um, through case studies for transferable, contextually relevant program recommendations. And this is done through finding context mechanism outcome configurations, which luckily Joe already went into, so I don't have to. <laughs> um, and with an understanding that mechanisms are generative. So um, under what context plus what type of mechanism is going to produce what type of outcome. And there could be a similar mechanism under a different context, but it's these, we want to find these patterns of what is this context and what is this mechanism and what outcome are these going to produce. So just a really quick background into the program so that you can understand a little bit more of the, the steps that I'll be explaining afterwards. Um, I'm doing my doctoral thesis on uh, a program that's run by World Vision Ireland across 10 sites in five sub-Saharan African countries, but I'm only looking at two sites across these 10. Um, and it's a maternal and child health program, so it works by delivering health messages, community-based interventions to pregnant women and families with children under two, um, all about, you know, more health, like behavior change communication messages. Um, and it's implemented through a series of community-based initiatives. So community health workers, which are like lay trained health workers that deliver the household messages. And then these community health committees, which act um, kind of as advocates for health service delivery in the community. They work in combination with the community health workers and the Ministry of Health and the health facility to kind of help implement, supervise, advocate, and just build overall community capacity for maternal and child health. Um, but to date, there really, a lot of programs actually use these types of committees in low-income countries, but there's really not a lot of work done on them or how they're implemented or how to implement them best. Um, and how this project really came about was They've been implementing this program for about five, almost five years now. It's coming to the end, but um, World Vision has had a lot of different reports on the functioning of these comms. Some are working really well, some aren't working really well, and they just don't really understand, you know, if we're doing the same thing across these different sites, why are our comms working differently? Why? Um, so enter realist evaluation. Um, <laughs> So we have, if we want to kind of understand uh, what we're trying to do in this specific case, I guess, is we have AIM Health intervention. So we have the inputs. We have their model and their comm model and what they're putting in across the different sites. And we have our outcome. With their overall outcome is capacity building. So we're kind of looking at outcomes around capacity building for maternal and child health. Um, and so we're trying to understand what generative mechanisms, under what context, they're going to help to produce or not produce that outcome of capacity building. Um, so it's again using community health committees across two contexts um, and really trying to understand how they work, why they work and who they work best for. Um, using a multi-method to like case study, um, intra-program case study in Tanzania and in Uganda. So when you're doing, if you're doing, a realist evaluation, uh, this is a realist evaluation cycle. So pretty straightforward. It looks a lot like a regular research cycle. We're going to start with our kind of overall research question. 
um, and then our general study design. So our overall research question for me was, you know, how are these comms working? Because we know that they are in some cases, or we think that they are in some cases, we think that they aren't in others. So what, how are they working? Under what context are they working? And then your general study design. So if your question that you want to answer to begin with isn't really a realist question, obviously your general study design can't be a realist study. Um, and then the next phase, which is, is different in a sense, is this formulating the initial program theory. Um, and this is what we kind of talked about with Mac and Joe. When you're refining your research question in a realist um, review, you're going to take a lot of time. You're going to start with something big, and you're going to narrow down the scope. And before you even start to search, you really want to understand. And so it is helpful to have some knowledge and some expertise. Um, sorry, those are just steps one and two. And now into the initial program theory. Um, but how you do this, there is a pretty set way for how you're going to elicit your initial program theory. So it is going to be based on um, literature and document review. So not just academic peer-reviewed literature, but program documents. So I looked at World Vision documents, Ministry of Health documents, other community health worker, community health group, coalition documents. Um, and then once you do that, you're also going to have consultation with stakeholders. So I did like five key informant interviews with the designer of the, the COM approach, the program implementers in Tanzania and Uganda, um, just to kind of make the program more, this initial theory, you know, provides more context to it and this kind of making sure that what the literature is saying is also what's kind of happening in practice. Um, and just, I did change it a fair bit. I think I realized um, doing, when I first developed the theory, I was very narrowly focused on just the, the group itself and talking to more people really realizing that, you know, the group component is only one aspect of such a bigger picture. And that would have been missed, or at least a really important chunk would have been missed if it didn't have this kind of other stakeholder feedback. So you're going to start this before you even start to think about what methods you're going to use to answer your research question. Um, so this is just a background to how I form the initial program theory. So the types of theories that were already arising, sorry, I know you can't see it very well, but, um, you know, so a literature review on these community health committees and, you know, those, I had five main theories that came out just of that. And then literature review on health volunteers, because these groups are volunteer health workers. Um, literature review on health promotion in general, so around capacity building and what's coming out of that. And then the guidelines and other documents. And then theories that are coming out of the, the, key informant interviews. So um, it's a lot of data that's just coming out before you're even starting to do your data, your primary data collection here. Um, so this is what my initial theory looks like, <laughs> kind of looks like. Um, a lot of them, if you look at other realist evaluations, some of them are much more simplified, um, but they all kind of have very similar components. I chose to keep mine a bit more detailed because it helps me to kind of more see and make sure I'm keeping everything. But so you have your intervention inputs, your potential outcomes. Um, but what's really important are these kind of mechanisms, because these are the things that you're going to base your, your a lot of your data tools around and how you're going to, what information you're going to collect when you're um, trying to refine your theory. And so your initial program theory then informs your field study design. Um, and so after you've completed your, your, your search of your theories, you're going to articulate that theory somehow. A lot of people do use visual representation, which is what I just showed you. And then you do have to do a process of selecting what you think is the most, are the most relevant theories for your project to test. So is this kind of, we've had a lot of talks about this during the realist review, is it, you're, it's not not biased. Like you do have to make decisions around what you think fits best. Not saying that's, a bad thing, but um, you do have to make judgment calls, and that's why having some background and some knowledge on it, some contextual knowledge on it does kind of help, but there will come a point in doing a realist study guaranteed that you are going to have to make um, a decision that you can't always support directly from the literature. Why I chose this theory over another theory. Um, and so my data collection has been informed by my 
initial theory, I guess. So I have, you know, I'm collecting data around the internal functioning, support strategies, the community, you know, receptiveness, but then also around some of the outcomes, just to try and look at are these outcomes really happening and what other outcomes could there be? Um, and then when you are doing realist methods, uh, primary, I guess, there's, um, <laughs> again, these, especially the data collection and the data analysis aren't really well defined yet. People are doing it differently and this is where I have come into the most amount of problems, I think, is having to just kind of make these decisions without having tons of precedent to kind of fall back on. So, uh, Pawson and Tilly do say that the best way to do it for qualitative data at least, and remember, um, realist evaluations are methods neutral, so they, they will likely be mixed methods, but they are going to be derived from your initial theory. So, you know, no, um, there will be qualitative, there will be quantitative, it could just be qualitative, it could just be quantitative, it really does depend. But, um, so when we're collecting data at least for qualitative, uh, you're kind of going to refine the theory together with your participant. Um, so it's the teacher-learner uh, interview process, if anybody's done that. So I'm going to, each interview that I had, I asked general questions about the theory anyway, um, but then I brought a simplified theory and taught people what I thought the theory was, asked them what their theory would be, what changes they would make, or anything like that. So they then taught me their theory, where I was the learner of their theory, um, and then we kind of refined it together. So, oh, is this what you mean? Is this how it was going? Um, I will comment that, I think I have it in the last slide, that I think it might work better in theory than in practice, at least in the context that I was working in. Um, I th it was quite difficult to kind of do this with some community women and community men in rural Uganda to try and explain the theories and even in a simplified and then get them to kind of feedback but um, that was the process that was taken even if the, <laughs> the result wasn't. Uh, um, and then when we go into data analysis which is actually where I am now on this so I don't have much to show you but um, Again, as I was saying, one of the problems that I am facing is there really is no specific technique that people are using. Um, some people are using just thematic analysis. Some people are using like a grounded theory um, method, like a cyclical three-stage, <coughs> more inductive to deductive. Some people are going deductive to inductive, using their, letting their initial program theory be their first line of coding and then going backwards. Other people are doing it the other way. Some people are just directly going in and looking at CMOCs. So the first, all they're doing is trying to find their CMOCs without any additional kind of um, coding throughout. Um, so in the synthesis phase then, but the ultimate goal of the data analysis is you need to develop your CMOCs. And then the synthesis phase is feeding these CMOCs back into your initial theory and refining it. And that, with that, ultimately, you're making your initial theory more context-specific, but then also more appropriate and real, I guess. Um, so, as we kind of talked about in the Realist Review, it is an iterative process. You could do case study after case study after case study after case study, and essentially just each time you're just getting a more refined theory, but each context is, again, going to be different. So, you really are just trying to find these like transferable findings that are relevant to other contexts. So if you have a context A that's similar to this, um, a, you know, context like this, then your mechanisms might be something like this or it might work through this way. Or if your context is like this, you know, you should really be careful of this or your outcome like this. So, um, yes, yeah, so it is just trying to get more refined, policy-relevant, contextually-relevant, transferable findings. Um, so just quick reflections from practice. Uh, I think, and I think that my supervisors and other people that we've been working on the other study think that a realist evaluation is very well suited to the study of complex health interventions. Uh, I think it's already given a lot of rich data that might not or that I don't think would come out from other studies. Um, though it is, pr I knew it was time consuming based on the realist review. That was very time consuming. 
but it is time consuming. Um, the analysis takes a long time, the initial program theory development takes a long time, so uh, I think I had a master's student suggest doing a realist and I said no. <laughs> I don't, like, unless you're doing a part time over two years, um, it is really time consuming. Um, and the methodology and its objectives don't always translate well into practice, at least for me, specifically in the data collection. So just be prepared for that. Um, <laughs> it could be very different in a different context, especially if people are more familiar or maybe easier to understand what a realist evaluation is or at least what your theory is. Um, but I do think that the evidence uptake we initially thought would be a concern. Um, but the NGO was really, really receptive to it. Again, WHO was receptive to it. It's still kind of this dissemination part and you know how much of these CMOCs or these recommendations, how much are they actually going to be taken on board? But um, both the protocols, so as I said, the one that's not quite as far, we just finished the program theory, which is why I didn't present it, that the development of the program theory so that meetings and uh, stakeholder interviews and stuff was funded by DFID and Wellcome Trust, so they're not opposed to, they haven't funded the whole study yet, so we'll let you know, but they're not 100% opposed to using realist methods. Um, and then a lot of realist evaluation protocols, well by a lot I mean like four, but they're starting to be published and um, so we have both manuscripts for each study are in review and so far I've had pretty positive feedback. So I think it is on the up and especially if you're just kind of starting and would have at least a year, I could imagine that, yeah, yeah, I think it's okay. Um, so that's a brief nutshell into realist evaluation. Yeah. Um, and then just, yeah, so the reference to is the Poston and Tilly. If you are thinking about it at all, I would just read that book. It's very clear, straightforward and Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Our, we're not going to keep it dormant anymore. Now we're very actively <laughs> engaged. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess starting from the the WHO working group and just a recognition of I think we like Joe Mack and I I guess started with the realist vote review and Eilish was in on it as well. It was kind of a ah. Huh, this actually is really interesting and really applicable and um, especially for at the center we do a lot of implementation science and a lot of work around programs and research around programs and stuff so we decided to start the um, global health realist working group so we try to meet and do readings and just uh, troubleshoot um, I think one of the most the best things for Joe and I at least myself in doing the realist review the first time was doing it together so we were on different projects but we had somebody to always troubleshoot off of. Um, I think if you're doing it for the first time it's really it would be really great to kind of have that network of other people to kind of talk to um, and the great thing about that is everything's kind of data collection as well in a realist review so I have supervisor meetings and feeding into the theory uh, and that's a form of data collection so and in our uh, review so these kind of troubleshooting and so get involved and you're welcome to contact us more I believe on the center's website or you can email me um, and I think we'll try and spark up the group a little bit more for those that are interested.